Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love Group and is part of the Education and Love series. In the How and Why I Remain Unloving presentation, Jesus encourages us to consider why we do not make love the highest priority of our lives introduces the main denials, excuses, and justifications we use to remain unloving, and outlines the most severe problem of a lack of personal will. Recorded on the 21st of February 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. How are we this morning? Refreshed? No. Oh, yes. No. Oh. Well, we're pretty much straight into it this morning, so um, how, what's our time like? Oh, I've got a cough here, I keep forgetting. Five minutes to go, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait, cause just in case there's a few missing. Just a couple. That music piece feels a bit confusing, did you notice that? You see, it's interesting how music manipulates your mood. And many of you who listen to music regularly have your mood constantly manipulated to, and therefore can't feel your own emotion. And, and, and like when you drive in a car, you're listening to music or whatever and those kind of things. And, and quite frequently what you're doing is zoning out of your own emotion and tuning into somebody else's. Mm. Yeah. And uh, you will find in time that you won't like that, actually you'll find in time that the emotion of the music or, or of the people, the performers, um, are so powerful that, that you just find that you're not attracted to f listening to, the, to their music as a result. <coughs> Make sense? Hmm. Well? What about like, classical pieces like Mozart? Like that? It's the same. It all manipulates your emotion. Obviously, some, of it, some pieces come from different places, you know. All, pretty much all, all music is spirit-inspired, most of it. And, uh, and when I say it comes from different places, some comes from the hells and some comes from the high, higher f uh, first sphere and some even from the second sphere and so forth. But uh, it's pretty rare to find a pla one on earth that comes from the second sphere. So you get a lot of manipulation of your mood. Yeah, yeah, and can do. That's why you know they've done studies with it, playing it to plants, and heavy metal kills plants, for example, and things like that. There's, you know, it's the same principle. In the in the certain types of music do have a negative effect both on our spirit on our spirit body, and but also but primarily on our soul, which is which is the emotional centre of ourselves, and so it, that's the area that gets manipulated the most. Yeah, I, I found a lot of the music myself in the 50s and 60s, it was sort of a lot, lot less manipulative. Um, and this is one reason why it's lived a long time since its production. Whereas like a lot of music in the 80s and 90s, you notice not much of it is around uh, still because, uh, you know, it was very often very manipulative. And, and as the societal mood changes, obviously, they're no longer attracted to that kind of music. Mm. So it's just interesting to see what happens to music. So um, what we've done in this, these particular sessions is we're trying to not manipulate your mood. <laughs> I want you to feel, <laughs> I want you to feel what you feel. Yeah. Who's handling our microphones today? Can you? Okay. Thanks, Wayne. And we're up the bat. What was your name? I can't. Sorry. Christine, that's right. Thanks, Christine. So uh, you go, you guys will be on the ball there with that. Don't be afraid to just. Stick it in front of somebody's face. Um, <laughs> and if those of you who have the mics, if some of you can just stop waving it around a bit and actually <laughs> have it, that would be helpful for Igor because he's having to chase your sound. That would be good. Okay. Well, we will get started now.
I'm just trying to have some inspiration about how to start this. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the session this morning is probably one of the most important sessions of these two days because most of the time we don't realise that we're actually not examining how and why we remain unloving, we're just being unloving. And, and we often look back on our unloving behaviour with regret or with guilt or with shame but, but when another circumstance or situation comes up in our lives that is very similar to the one we just left, we uh, go and act exactly the same way. And then of course we go through another cycle of shame or guilt or, or, uh, and self-attack. And, and, uh, and then the shame, guilt and self-attack, really what it does to us is it, is it enables us to do the unloving behaviour again. That's what it does. And so we do it again. And again, and again, and again. And, and eventually, um, obviously, as each time we do it, the law of compensation, as you'll learn when we learn, talk about the laws, the law of compensation builds up and, and we have more regret and we have more shame and we have more guilt as a result of that. And most of us, when we process emotion and not actually processing causal emotion, what we're really doing is we're processing the guilt, the shame and the other emotions that are the result of the law of compensation doing its work upon our soul, trying to get us to, see, to feel the pain of our behaviour. So what we need to do instead is examine this question, how and why do I remain unloving? We've got to examine that question carefully. And, and to be honest with you, after the discussion today, you're going to see that it's a it's very basic reason. Very basic reasons. Really easy to remember. <laughs> but very difficult to change if you don't address four things in particular. So what I want to do with you now is ask you about what you think are the reasons why you and how you remain unloving. What do you think? So, Pete, if we, Peter? It's to totally avoid my own feeling. Yes, so, so uh, obviously that, that's one reason why. Is it a reason? I'm just thinking. It's easier for me to say get angry at Eloisa mm -hmm. than feel the real reason of, of what's triggered it. I agree with that. Uh, why is it easier though? See, see um, uh, uh, it's all right, you don't have to answer the question. Um, you see, what I see when I ask this question, and, and, and what, what you're going to find in our dialogue this morning, is that we say, oh, it's easier for me to get angry with Eloisa than it is to feel my own feelings, right? And that might feel like that's the truth to you. But the reality is, the... Uh, Getting angry with Eloisa is causing a huge amount of, of difficulty for both of you in your relationship. So can you really say it's easier? No. Not it, really, can you? It just feels like it gets actually worse and worse. It gets worse. Totally. So, so we've got to, and this is something we want to cover again, which we'll be covering on Friday. You know, we've got to start measuring the pain of what we do. And we can't t keep telling ourselves that it's easier to do something when actually... it. The results are that it feels pretty harsh, you know, it feels pretty difficult. So um, while I agree that it might feel easier to attack somebody else rather than actually address your emotions in the moment, the reality is it's not because it's creating a whole heap of subsequent problems which are not easy. Yeah. To address and can take days, weeks, months. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, you know, they can have no connection with your partner for months if you're not careful. Just from one thing, one unloving thing you've chosen to do, just because you wanted to avoid a feeling uh, that was inside of yourself at the time. And, and this is where, like, what I notice is most people are using words that sort of re reinforce the concept that it's easier to not address things than it is to address things. And that's total crap. It is. It is much harder to 
uh, to not address things than it is to address things, right? But you all believe at this stage that it's much easier to not address things than it is to address things. And this is a major difference between yourself and God at this point, right? God knows that it's much easier to address things than it is to leave things be. Leaving things be causes huge amounts of problems in the longer term. That's what is the major cause of pain and suffering. Right. Now, can I just raise an issue about fear? Because many of you are going to come up with fear-based reasons as to why you're unloving. But, but fear is a human creation. It's got no, inside of God there is no fear whatsoever. Right? And once you're at one with God, inside of you there will be no fear whatsoever. So fear is a human creation. Fear itself is a sin. Right? Because it's out of harmony with love. So, and what I notice many of you doing is justifying to yourself your fears. Constantly. You're saying, oh, I do that because I'm afraid of this, or I do that because I'm afraid of that. No, that's not the reason. The, the problem is this. The f this is the first problem that we have. Right? I excuse, deny, justify, minimize, or blame others. for my fear <laughs> the second problem is this and you could switch these around if you wish to I excuse deny justify Minimize or blame others for my lack of faith. And the third problem is this. <laughs> I excuse, deny, justify, minimize, or blame others for <coughs> lack of, my lack of action. But I'm going to focus firstly on another one that I feel more important than even action. For my, so I'm going to go, I, I don't know if I want to write all of that again, but I'll go for my resistance to truth and then of course let's look at the other one which is for my lack of action These are the primary reasons why and how we remain unloving. Does that make sense? Now what I'd like to do with you now is discuss them. Discuss these particular reasons that you have for remaining unloving. Because I don't really think they're reasons. To me they're, they're just excuses, aren't they, really? Right? Because all, all of that it ends up with one sum, sum total fact, and that is
I just really want to remain unloving. Now, I'm not talking about what you think you want here. I'm talking about what you feel you want. And that is often very, very different to each other. Right? So we're talking about what, what you feel you want. So, so, for example, when I start talking about fear with people, man, it's like they either excuse it, they deny they have it. Men are great at denying they have it. Like men, men, that's your main problem, denying that you have fear, because most of, most of you live in intense amount of fear. But, but with women, generally I find they excuse it or justify it or minimise it or shift the blame onto somebody else for it. Right? And, and that's a choice. That's a will-based choice to do that. So who's responsible for that choice? I am. I'm responsible for the choice. You're responsible for the choice. Every time you do any one of those things about your fear, you're responsible for the choice. You can't blame your mum and dad, and you can't blame spirits for it, and you can't blame influence, and you can't blame you know, your circumstances in life or whatever else. It's a choice you're making to just excuse it, justify it, minimise it, shift the blame, or deny that it exists. It's a choice that's being made. With regard to the lack of faith, constantly people say, oh yes, but I have a lack of faith because of this, and I have a lack of faith because of that. I'm sorry, you have a lack of faith because you're choosing to have a lack of faith. <laughs> because it's convenient to have a lack of faith. There's plenty of evidence that God exists. There's plenty of evidence that God's laws are constant. There's plenty of evidence in the universe, if you want to find it, uh, of all of those particular things. Your lack of faith in that is completely the result of your choice. Now, sure, when you were a child, others made your choices for you. But you're an adult now. You're making your choices. You can't, you can't start, keep blaming people for things that you're choosing to do. Do you see? We've got to be, take self-responsibility. The amount of times I hear people say, oh yeah, and the Spirit's put this influence on me and I went ahead and did this. No, you made a choice. You're making choices all the, all the time, every day. Like A lot of your days are, are choice after choice after choice after choice after choice. But the problem is that most of the choices are being made with the exercise of your will are to remain unloving. They're not actually to become more loving. You're just making a choice and, and you don't even want to claim responsibility for your choice. It's like, no, somebody else caused that. I just, I just went along for the ride or somebody else influenced me there or whatever. No, it was your choice. When, when are you going to see it's your choice? See, God's trying to teach us to become self-responsible beings. That's what part of free, learning about your free will is all about. And developing in, when you develop your will to love, you need to start developing your will to make choices that are in harmony with love. Right? You can receive some love from God, but if you choose to not make a choice, you know, to, to make a decision that's out of harmony with the, the love you've received, then you're going to have extra pain. That's the way it's going to work. That's why many of you, initially, when you heard Divine Truth, were very happy about what you heard. And then after a year or two, and it starts getting down to the personal thing, many of you have now, like, I hardly ever see a smile on your face. Why is that? It's because you're bearing the consequences of your choices. That's what compensation is all about. Having to bear the consequence of your own free will choices. You can choose differently. But at this stage, many of you have got so many justifications for making the same choice over and over and over again. And what I'd like to do is raise a few of those justifications with you. And it's the same with regard to my resistance to God's truth. Same with regard to my lack of action. It's the same in regard to my feelings about God himself or herself. So let, let's look at this lack of faith issue first for a moment. 
What justifications, minimizations, do you have personally for a lack of faith in God? What are they? You tell me. Because you, you obviously have them because you don't have much faith in God. So what are they? All right, if we go next to you, Wayne. It was all the things on the board yesterday, how I've projected at God all the stuff that was really my parents and my father's. Right, can we, so sort of so saying... rage at him not protecting me, rage at him exposing me to abuse, all that stuff which was my family and others around me. So let's summarise all that, shall we, Denise? If we put all that in one basket, it's really that I don't have any faith in God's goodness, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Now, now whose fault's that? Mine. <laughs> yes, you can change that. You could get to know God more and then you'd have some faith in God's goodness. But, but instead what we do is we use that as an excuse to not get to know God. And, and as I said yesterday, if we're, if we're rejecting our relationship with God already, then our only chance to gain an education in love is from a higher source, the higher source we're rejecting. So, so what's, what's the subsequent result? We're not going to gain any education in love. No, staying in pain and blaming everybody else. Yeah, that's right. Mm. That's the result. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a lack of faith in God's goodness. Almost all of you have a lack of faith in God's goodness. You don't believe God's good. Right? So, so you make the assumption that God's going to punish you, he's going to blame you. Yet many of you, when you ask for love and don't feel like you receive it, think that God's not giving it to you. Huh? The only reason why you're not receiving it is because you're blocking it entering you. God's already giving it. Right? Your lack of faith is that you're, you're, you're willing to tell yourself that when you ask for love and you don't receive it, it means that God doesn't give it. No, it doesn't. God's already giving it. You're not receiving it. So, so whose choice is that? It's not God's choice that you aren't receiving it. It's yours. You follow? Now, many of you see that even in relationships you do the same thing. You say, oh, the other person doesn't love me when they're actually loving you. And then you say they do love you when they're not actually loving you. It's because what? Our definition of love is all upside down. Right? So when, when your partner's not feeding your addiction, you go, oh, he's not loving me now. He's a terrible guy, you know. Have a chat behind his back, you know, to some other girls because, you know, they love you. They're going to feed your addiction. So, so you know, you wish the, wish the girls could be, I don't know, somehow mixed up with the guy so that you'd have the <laughs> ideal person, right? But, but the reality was when he doesn't feed your addiction, he's, he, he is loving you. When he feeds your addiction, he's not loving you. But you feel the other way around. So, so when love does not flow from God into you, it's never, never because of something God has chosen to do with you. Do you understand? It's because of what you have chosen to do in rejection of God's love. Right? Now, some of those things come from your childhood, but you can't blame your childhood now. <laughs> You're an adult now. You, you could have chosen now as an adult to release the emotions that block the flow of love between God and you. You could have chosen to do that, but you're not. That's a choice you're making. And there's reasons perhaps for, your, for the choice, but the primary reason is I just really want to stay as I am. That's the primary reason. I just really don't want to use my will to be loving. That's the primary reason. I just don't see any point in growth. Another reason. A choice we're making. A choice based on our will. Right? This is why your will is un and understanding your will is so important. When you understand your will, you don't blame other people for your choices. Never. How else? Uh, what other things about God might you feel? That it can't see 
God's love in the world, like the power of God's love in the world. Yes. So sort of like that, so almost like evidence that God doesn't love in the world. Is yeah. that? Yep. And and that's uh, and that's true. True. You won't see much evidence of God's love in the world. Do you know why? Because none of the world receive God's love. And and so they act all out of harmony with God's love and and therefore harm each other and hurt each other and so forth. And and the problem is even the natural things in the world all respond to the human condition. Or they're all reflecting to us our own lack of love so the most the thing you're going to see most in the world is the lack of love and do you see that yeah and the reason there's a reason for that and that is the way god's designed the whole universe is so that the humankind the pinnacle of his creation have an effect on the rest of the creation so so that when the rest of the creation reflects the lack of love humankind might go oh everything looks a bit more unloving now and maybe we're doing the wrong thing. Right? That's why it's there. But then what we do, and I find this quite sad, and it's really quite hypocritical actually if you think about it, blaming God for not being where God was at the beginning but humans denied it and then created a whole heap of negative things as a result of their denial and then we see the results of that denial and then we blame God for that denial. Like, how fair is that? Would you, would, would you like it if I blamed you for something you never did? It doesn't feel good, does it? But God's getting blamed for something God's never done. But why do we want to keep blaming God for something God's never done? Why do we want to do that? Well, the answer to that is quite obvious. Because we don't want to take responsibility for what we've done. We want somebody else to blame. And God's great, a great one because God doesn't blame us back. God doesn't attack us for blaming him. God doesn't punish us for blaming him. And God doesn't do a whole heap of other things for blaming him. And so he's the best one to blame. He's the one that's safe to blame. He's the one that's safe to attack, safe to abuse, safe to do a whole heap of things with. All, all negative. He's safe because he's not going to do what the average person on earth would do if we blamed them. <laughs> the average person on earth, if he's a male, would probably bump, bop you in the nose. The average woman would plan your methodical destruction over the next 20 years. <laughs> that's true, isn't it? Like, that's how we respond when somebody does something we feel was unjustified, isn't it? And, and, so, and yet that's... God doesn't do any of those things, so God's the easiest person to blame, right? So that's a problem. All right. I even, you know, there's even things you do that are even more basic than that. Just tell yourself God doesn't exist. If you tell yourself God doesn't exist, you don't have to have faith in anything. You can live by your doubt. Living by doubt is, a, is, a, is what I feel, what I would classify as a, a person who doesn't take responsibility for themselves way out. Because if you live by your doubt, you don't have to make any choices or decisions. You can just say, oh, yeah, but it is like that, but, but it may be not like that, so I don't really have to make a decision one way or the other. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I don't have to stand up for truth and I don't have to stand up for love. I don't have to do something that might get me attacked because there's doubt. Doubt's a reliable way of avoiding a whole heap of positive action. Right? And so what we do is we go so far as to tell ourselves, hey, God does it. we don't know if God exists or not. And you know what? Instead of finding out whether God exists or not, well, like a truly self-responsible being would do, right? we just go, no, God, you know, we don't know whether God exists or not. And then we go, and it's impossible to know. So we tell ourselves another excuse. It's impossible to know whether God exists or not. And so now my lack of faith is completely justified. I don't have to have faith anymore. I don't have to do anything with that. I don't have to make decisions based on it anymore. 
I don't have to make any decisions involving God anymore as soon as I make that decision. Very convenient decisions, aren't they? Very convenient choices. That all just lets us off the hook. Right? Now, the sad thing is that while we might get let off the hook or seemingly let off the hook on earth, as soon as you pass, unfortunately, you'll find that you haven't been let off the hook. All right, so what else we, about God? Like, how about this? We don't have any faith in how God created us. God created us to be self-responsible, to make choices and decisions. God created us, created us to have a capacity to feel any emotion, any emotion. How many of you believe that? Most of you say to me things like, oh, no, I'm not, I won't be able to cope with that. Oh, I don't think I'll be able to handle that. What? Like God created you to handle things. Right? And you can't even die. Like many of you are afraid, uh, if I go through that emotion, I'll die. <laughs> you can't die. So you arrive in the spirit world, you'll still be alive with the same emotion. <laughs> right? So, so not having confidence in the way that God created you is actually a lack of faith in God. It's not a lack of faith in yourself, although it is partly that. But it's mostly a lack of faith in God. You, you, know, you lack faith that God created you perfect. You lack faith that God created you with the capacity to become perfect. You lack faith that God created you with the capacity to deal with every emotion. You lack faith that God created you with the capacity to understand every truth. But it's convenient. Because then I don't have to go searching for truth. I don't have to go feeling my emotions. I don't have to go... Like, I make these lack of faith choices because they seemingly are convenient to me at the time. And I say seemingly because most of it, you look at the world, is it convenient? Like, is it, is it a fantastic world that we live in with no war, no malnutrition? Like, 50 million children die still every year from just malnutrition. And we've got companies that have billions and billions of dollars. There's people burning food to maintain the price level of food and yet millions of people are dying every year. There's over 50 or 60 million abortions every year. So, so we're perfectly okay as a society with killing over 100 million children every year. Perfectly okay with it. That's more children, more children, more people, than died in the Second and First World Wars combined. Every year dying because we're okay with it, because we're making dis choices and decisions. Right? And that's just with the children. We haven't even <laughs> talked about the adults yet. And we're okay with that. Why are we okay with that? Because we're doing all this excusing and denying and justifying and shifting the blame and saying it's somebody else and saying minimising it and saying there's nothing we can do and all these kind of things that we do because that's what we do to get away with things. And we've got to stop doing that personally as well as globally. Right? You think about that. It's a, it's a, like I just think about the children's side of things. Like, children are the worst treated people on this planet, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And yet, how many of you say, oh, it's so wonderful we have a child? And how many of you ladies have said, I need to have a child? How many of you are desperate to have children, right? And really, how much of it is really just for you, not for them? Right? There's so many of them that are harmed every single year, every single year. And then we haven't even factored in the miscarriages, of which there's nearly 200 million a year. And most of those miscarriages happen because those children cannot exist in the womb of that particular family and that particular mother because of the different emotions that are so negative to the child that it has to leave the womb. Now, I know you don't believe that, most of you, at this point, but that's exactly what's happening. 
I've talked to many thousands of miscarried children over my lifetime. I know exactly how they felt. Right? And yet we're okay with that too. We're okay with all these projections at the, all, at the children, all this neediness going towards the children, all these desires that we want them to fulfil, all this proof that we want them to give us about our lives and how, whether our lives have any worth or not. And we don't see all the damage that's being done. Because, and we have no faith that it's going to be any different either. We don't, we don't even want to face the truth about that. Right. We, don't, we don't want to face the truth about hardly anything. When we get sick, what do we do? We go to a doctor and say, what kind of pill can I have to fix this particular sickness? When I've got a headache, it's the same, isn't it? And when I've got whatever it is, we, we want to go to somebody and have a quick fix for it, not understanding that it's actually our emotional state that created this particular physical problem. Right? But we're in denial of that too. We, don't, we want to excuse that, minimise that, shift the blame of that, put the blame on doctors when they can't do it. We, we put the blame on God. Well, I don't know why God took my mother who had cancer, that kind of stuff. We do that all the time. Why? Because we don't want to take personal responsibility for our personal decisions, for our personal condition. Can you see the problem? It is a big problem, a big problem. And in the outlines I've given you, many of you have printed them out, I know, you'll see that under each section of these particular things, we have listed a number of statements that we make to ourselves. So what I'd like to do is just read a few out for you. <coughs> What helps me to deny, excuse or justify or lie to myself to support my lack of faith? Well, let's look at the faith in God. I've, I've listed, I tell myself God doesn't exist. We've already covered that. I tell myself I'm already a part of God. Isn't that convenient? I tell myself I can never really know God. I tell myself knowing having faith in God is not important to my life. <coughs> After you've just told yourself those four things, you will never have any faith in God. And remember, if you don't have any faith in God, there's very little you can do about it, developing a relationship with God and receiving love from God and therefore receiving education from God. So basically, you've now just consigned your entire life to self-exploration -explor with no assistance whatsoever from anybody who is actually in a higher condition than yourselves. That's what you've done, as soon as you do that. And, and the majority of people on the planet are perfectly happy with that. And in fact, the majority of people on the planet think that's the proper way to live. Have faith in how God created me. I tell myself that God didn't create me. <laughs> I tell myself that human evolution is survival of the fittest. You know, it's the one who's the toughest and the most nasty that gets ahead, right? I tell myself that God created me imperfectly and we then justify the imperfection. Like, that's what religions do, right? The Christian religion is great at that one. I tell myself that God's creation of me was flawed. There was something wrong with me right from the beginning and we needed God to correct it. If, if we need God to correct it, why didn't he correct it right at the beginning? Not very logical, but that's how we think. I tell myself I do not have the capacity to become perfect. Now, most of you are telling yourself that every day. You, you, you sort of see perfection as some imaginary, like, utopian dream of some kind that could ne will never become a reality. Like, I've got a hundred million celestial friends who tell you differently, but, but that doesn't make any difference to you because you don't want to hear from them. When you're in that state, all you want to do is tell yourself that it's okay to be imperfect because that's a part of the flawed human condition. And isn't that convenient? You know, when we have a war, we go, oh, that's a part of the flawed human condition. When, when the 100 million children die every year, we go, that's a part of the flawed human condition. You know, when someone in our family dies of cancer or some other disease, we go, that's a part of the flawed human condition. That's the way it goes. All very convenient. It stops us from examining the real reason why any of these events occur. 
That's what it does. It alleviates us from taking responsibility. We just don't want to take responsibility for the fact that we're choosing to remain unloving. And we are. Does that make sense? What else have I got to do? I, do? I tell myself I can't change. I tell myself while I live on earth, I've got to conform to the rest of what the earth does. I tell myself that God and the world doesn't reward any goodness in a person. You know that, right? I know that too. You know, if you're a good person, what happens to you? You just get pummeled, right? I tell myself God doesn't care about anything. God created a harsh and dangerous universe. God is punishing and cruel. God is worse than the average human. God's a desperate, a tyrant and a narcissist. Human pain is God's problem. <laughs> human pleasure is fleeting and based on only based on getting addictions met. So after I've told myself all that, I don't have much faith in God's goodness, right? Faith in God's laws. I tell myself that my version of law is the only correct version of law. <laughs> I tell myself there's no law but human law. God's laws can be manipulated and broken with impunity. I tell myself God's laws are inconsistent and unreliable, so there's no point in trying to understand them. And there's no benefits from following them either, and they're not loving or kind. So when you and I discuss the law of attraction, every single discussion I've ever had, I think, with, about the law of attraction, which is a beautiful, loving law, most people are trying to tell me how unloving it, it, it is. Okay, but it's not unloving because it's happening to you and it's a loving thing for it to be happening to you. God doesn't make an unloving law, but we want to believe that it is. Oh, it feels cruel and it feels harsh and it feels terrible. and You know? Same as the law of compensation. Why could Bill be so cruel and have people in the hells for thousands of years, you know, in such a dark condition? And all they did on earth was they just tried to be a good person. You know, this is our justifications. Faith in God's truth. I tell myself it's impossible to find out the absolute truth. If you had heard how many discussions I've had with people saying that there is such a thing as absolute truth and they're saying to me no there's not you would be absolutely astounded i've had millions of conversations along those lines in my life where people are trying to tell me there's no such thing as absolute truth the new age movement tells you what there's my truth and there's your truth and you're allowed to have your truth and i'm allowed to have my truth isn't that so convenient so that means if you and I disagree, we don't have to resolve anything. That's my truth and that's your truth. Right? I tell myself that what I believe is the truth. So if I don't believe something is false, and if I do believe something, then it must have been true. Right? I tell myself that what I know about myself is the real truth. This, this is a problem I find almost all the time. Every time I discuss another person's problem in front of you, you generally agree with me. But as soon as I pro discuss your problem in front of other people, you can't agree with me. What does that tell me? It tells me this, this is the problem. What I know about myself is the truth, is what all of you individually believe. But, but it's not God's truth. And therefore it's not the truth, it's just your imaginary, your imaginary desire to hold on to an unloving condition. I tell myself the truth is scary, the truth hurts, that ignorance is bliss, that it's not important anyway, that, that withholding the truth is actually loving, isn't it? I can't tell my husband that, he would be so hurt. I can't tell my wife that, she'd be so hurt. Does my bum look fat in these jeans? <laughs> no, darling. No, darling. It's fine. <laughs> I lie. I tell myself that others will never accept God's truth. And so I need to first care for my own safety rather than worrying about God's truth. Right. 
So you know what happens then is, uh, is I'm in one situation, I'll do one thing. I'm in another situation, I'll do almost do exactly the opposite thing. And I'm in one situation with a bunch of people who want me to be loving, so I'll be loving. I'm in another situation with a bunch of people who don't want me to be loving, so I'll be unloving. I'll, I'll do whatever the people around me tell me to do because I'm afraid that if I don't do that, something might happen to me. They might attack me or they might think I'm a bad person or you know, they, they might even try to hurt me in some way or, or they might just you know, say some things behind my back that are hurtful or whatever and I don't want any of those things so I'll just do whatever the person I'm with does. Right. Now when it comes to faith in God's love this is what we tell ourselves. God doesn't care. God's harsh. God's punishing and cruel. God get ang God, God's angry and wants to hurt me. God causes my pain. God is just a concept anyway. God's not love isn't powerful or strong. It's just weak anyway. And love can be taken from me. And love isn't an emotion anyway. It's just a thought. There's there's whole there's whole movements on the internet, both in the Christian and the New Age face that are all saying that God's love is not an emotion. Isn't that convenient? You don't have to feel about it. You've just got to think about it. Right? Why, why do you want to tell yourself this terrible lies? Because it causes you to justify your lack of faith. How about faith in God's way? I tell myself, there's no such thing as sin. There's no, such, there's no penalties for sin. Sin's just a concept created by a Christian faith. Addictions and facade are not sins. Sin is only dependent on human perception. In other words, some people think some things are wrong, but other people think those same things are right. Right? That my intellect is the strongest part of me and the emotions are the weakest part of you. So don't go about acting on an emotional level. You've got to act on a thought level, an intellectual level. I talk about God's love without feeling it. Most of you are guilty of that. And I want to believe I am following God's way when I plainly am not. <laughs> And now we, that was just one list about the lack of faith. Now, one exercise that I feel that each of you need to really engage if you're going to be serious about examining the reasons why and how you remain unloving is to actually go through these particular four things and start looking at and examining and feeling about and I, I would suggest firstly start writing down what are your personal justifications for these particular things? So what I would like you to do is to change, to change this around and say, like, I do excuse, deny, justify, minimise or blame others for my lack of faith. What do I tell myself to do that? What are the kinds of things I feed myself on a daily basis to, to do that? And it can be just very simple, like, it could be just very simple, so simple, like, yes, I know I should be doing that, but I don't have any faith in it. And, and, that, and that's it, the end of the story. You just feel you don't have any faith in it. And I would say to you, well, why don't you get some? Why don't you get some faith? You know, getting some faith is quite a simple process, actually. All you've got to do is put something to the test over a period of time and measure the results. That's all you've got to do. And then after that, you'll have some faith in the results. But of course, with God's with God stuff, it's got to be sincere. You can't, you can't just test it like a scientist without getting personally involved. You've got to be personally involved in the process. Right? It's got to be an emotional engagement of some kind for yourself. But you can grow your faith 
So if you don't have any faith, it's nobody's fault other than your own. God, God's got huge amounts of evidence out there in the universe that God exists and that God's good and that all of God's laws are good and that, and, and that if you follow God's laws, you will benefit from them and the whole world will benefit from them. There'll be less death, there'll be less destruction, there'll be less malnutrition, there'll be less wars and there'll be less everything. You know, like There's huge amounts of evidence about that. And yet... And what, what do we do? Oh, still really, ha uh, it's, p it's convenient to have the doubt, right? Because the doubt lets us off the hook. The doubt lets us get away with behaviour that if we had no doubts, we knew we couldn't engage. It's convenient to not resolve these questions. It's convenient. Now, uh, my feelings are too that for many of you it's convenient to not resolve the question of who I am. It's convenient. Because right? then you don't have to listen to things you don't like hearing. It's convenience. And this is what you do with, with God too. Same thing. Anything you don't want to hear, you just reject. Laura? Thanks, Chrissy. Um, I was just wondering, like with the emotion of anger, a lot of us as children, when we got angry, we got punished. I understand that. But with fear and... Um, my personal huge resistance to it is it that I was frightened once as a child and something bad happened or is it just that my parents had so much fear and I learned <coughs> never to even go there in the first place well I, I feel you know the answer to that already you, it's a combination of those things isn't it if you let yourself feel about these particular things, you'll know that it's a combination of the fact that your parents obviously have fears of some kind, which obviously you imbibe, but also during your childhood, your parents treated you badly and sometimes were quite violent with you, which also created fear inside of you. But none of that's the problem. The problem is the fact that you don't want to release it. You don't want to feel it now and release it. You, you want to leave it inside of you. That's the problem. And, and you can't blame your parents on that, can you? I, was just I couldn't associate it with something that bad that happened when I was feeling the fear. It doesn't matter where it, it doesn't matter associating it really, does it, at the end of the day? If it's in you, it's in you. It needs to come out and the only way it's going to come out is by feeling it and you've got total control over it, whether you feel it or not. No one else. Even Fab can't do it for you. He can, he can sit there and try to cheer you on and everything but that doesn't help either. Does it? It's like, unless you do it yourself, it's not going to be done. It's not going to be done. You remember the channeling with Man Mandy, I think it was, the Christian, well, she was a Mormon lady in, the, in, in America, um, that we did the channeling for before this group. And you remember how she arrived in the spirit world and she banded together with a whole other heap of other people who all felt they had a service to do. And she was just avoiding her terrible fear about what happened in her childhood, right? And she, and she avoided it, avoided it, avoided it. And remember what eventually happened? They all started degrading in their condition because of them still teaching other people falsehood. And, and as they degraded in condition, the very people she was afraid of started to be around them and surround them and started to attack them and so forth. And it wasn't until she cried out in her terror and started to feel her fear and as soon as she did that bang it was like those people were gone and she was just feeling right? many of you would rather have a whole heap of people around you attacking you and abusing you and everything than feel your fear you would I don't know why but you would and you're in that place Laura yeah you've the, spirit, the spirits with you pummel you all all day every day Right, and you're terrified of them and you'll do anything they want. And at the, pro the problem with doing anything that a person who's terrorising you wants is that you're never going to get out of your fearful condition. Does that make sense? Never going to get out of it. But it's a justification to go, oh, but is it this to do my childhood or that to do my childhood? Well, hang on a sec, 
yes, there are a whole heap of things to do with the childhood that are actually influencing this, this thing. But the biggest problem is none of those things. The biggest problem is the choice to not feel it. The choice to remain unloving. The, de the decision that you're making. That's the biggest problem. Because you make the right decision and you've got all the help in the world. You've got uh, lovely, beautiful spirits who want to help you work your way through it. You've got God assisting you to work your way through it. You've got, all the, you've got your own family, in your case, your, your hubby and everybody who is willing to help you go through it. So, so you know, it's not like some who have got nobody, not many people on earth around them who want them to go through it. You've got that as well. And, and so it's really... The choice you're making that's causing this particular problem. Does that make sense? And you're afraid, terrified to make a different choice, but you're justifying your terror. You're saying, because I'm terrified, I shouldn't have to make another choice. You know, what I notice most people do, and, and w women unfortunately are much more terrified than men, and the main reason why, ladies, you are much more terrified than men is because generationally women have had a lot more harsh things happen to them than men, right? And that's why many of you are much more terrified than men are. Um, but, but the biggest problem is that you're terrified of feeling the terror itself, right? Because many of you personally, as in Western society, have not received anywhere near the amount of terrifying things that the average person 2,000 years ago or the average person in other countries right at this moment in, in third world countries are actually experiencing. Right? You've not experienced those things. But unfortunately, every one of those sisters of yours who pass, who are in that terrified condition, they come and overcloak every woman on earth who was also in a similar condition and and increase the terror that you're experiencing but that is all because you're all still making the decision the decision to remain unloving rather than just to feel your terror you follow yeah so so i don't feel like sure all of you have had damage from your child your your family of origin all of you all of you are going to have to work your way through that and release that. But that's not the primary problem. The primary problem is the willingness to actually not take personal responsibility for doing that. That's the primary problem. Right? That's how we remain unloving. It, you can have a very... Uh, I'll give you an example. There's many examples we could give, but let's give you one that's quite easy to see. You can have two people who have both been sexually abused, right? One goes off and has a life of abusing other children. Another goes off and has a life of trying to help other children. They've both been abused. So what was the difference between those two people? One made a loving choice. That's the only difference. One made a loving choice, one made an unloving choice. Right? And this is what we've got to see, is that actually progressing on the path, as you call it, you call it the divine love path, I call it God's way. Progressing on God's way is quite simple, unless you try to make it complicated. And why, what do we get out of making it complicated? We don't have to do it. See, that's why that's why we want to make it complicated because we don't have to do it then. Uh, it's really simple, you know. It's just a few basic things: feel all of my emotions rather than acting upon them. Choose to do the loving thing rather than the unloving thing. Ask God for love all the time in my life, and and also act in harmony with the love that I've received. Like it's all fairly simple, and <laughs> when you think about it, like that's why I said in the first century, a child could understand this. If a child can understand that, you can, right? But see, we don't want to understand it because understanding it means that we'd have to take some responsibility for our decisions and choices and we don't want to take responsibility for our decisions and choices because it's convenient to excuse our choices and deny that we even have them and to blame others for them and to minimise them and to, and to justify every single act that we have so that we don't have to take any responsibility and then we die and we arrive in the spirit world and the very first thing that the law of compensation does is start grinding us into submission. 
And then we go, why are we having so much trauma? And, we, and to be honest, there's so many spirits going, why are we having so much trauma? Why is it so hard here? It's so hard here because you did not use your will to make a different choice. All right? As soon as you use your will to make a different choice, things are different. If I can give another example, Mary said to me just a few weeks ago that she's realised that for eight years she's basically been fighting making loving choices. And she realised the main reason why was because she's terrified of who she is and what she came here to do. Right? She's just terrified of it. So she's done everything she possibly can to avoid making decisions in harmony with that. Now, I feel each of you are doing that every day. Just making choice after choice after choice after choice. Feed an addiction? No worries. Have an addiction fed? No worries. Present my facade to somebody? No worries. You know, they're just little choices every single day, but they're all helping you remain unloving. And, and while, while you're being helped to remain unloving by your own desire, by your own will, what, who can surround you? Like our, our lovely celestial friends go, I'd like to help this person, I'd like to help this person, I'd like to help this person, but look at what they're doing. I can't help them. They just make choice after choice after choice, they're out of harmony with love, and they know it even half the time. Right? And what can I do to help them? I can't help them. You know, for every person on earth that would like to actually make a sincere, loving choice, there are literally 50 to 100 celestial spirits ready to help them. So that tells you that there's very little people on earth who actually want to make a loving choice. Right. So this is what, something that we need to consider, is to, is to look at our reasons for doing so, and our primary reason is, I just really want to do what I want to do. I think of that as freedom. But, but you're not measuring the results, the pain that comes from that choice. Gary, you wanted to ask if we just have a mic. <coughs> yeah, I'm um, sure how this is going to come out. But it's, um, so can we get... I think I've got into trouble by using my willpower to try and make a loving choice rather than it be loving. I'm not... Sure. That's not what I observe, Gary. If I observe your life, I see you making unloving choice after unloving choice. Not, you're not even using your willpower to make a loving choice. You're making a choices to feed your addiction. You're making choices to just <coughs> continue doing things the way you've already done them to make your life feel easier and so forth. That, that, that's not a problem of using your willpower to make a loving choice. That's a problem of using your soul-based will to make an unloving choice. Do you follow? Yeah. 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 So stop telling yourself that you're using your willpower to make a loving choice when actually you're making a soul-based, will-based, a real will-based choice to not do, be the loving thing, do the loving thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is what I see many of you doing. Like, you're even telling yourself that I'm, I'm trying to be a better person while right in that moment being a worse person. <laughs> Because your, your heart is leading you in that direction. And you don't want to take responsibility to change that. But we, the worst person you can lie to is yourself. You know that, right? Why? Because if you lie to yourself, you're not going to get anywhere. So, so stop, ly stop lying to yourself and telling yourself that you're actually trying to do the right thing when many times in the day you are in refusal of doing the right thing. You have no intention of doing the right thing. Right? Now some of you are not in that place, but the majority are. The majority are. Where you just, whenever, whenever a decision point comes up where you feel it's going to be inconvenient or, or some, something to yourself, something negative that you b or perceive as negative to yourself, you will, in most cases, make an unloving choice. 
And at some point, you've got to say, hang on a sec, hang on a sec. I've got, I've got to stop blaming and shifting the blame and, and denying and all these other things that I do, you know, excuse, deny, justify, minimise, blame others. These are the things I do. I've got to stop doing that before I can actually make a different choice. Right? So what, what, I'd, what I'd like you to do, and, and you'll, notice, you'll notice so far, we've only really done three prime or four primary presentations Three yesterday and this one this morning. That's all we've done, right? But each one of those presentations has raised some issues which need some thorough investigation from sincere people, haven't they? So we go, yesterday there was the, the issues regarding, you know, do you really want to know truth? Do you really want to feel it? Do you really want to connect to the source of, of, uh, and have an education of love or are you just talking about it? What, what is it that you want? You need to sort that out. Are you just here because it makes you feel good about yourself while you're here? Makes you feel like you're doing something? Right? When really, from your day-to-day life, you're not really doing it much when it comes to dealing with these things. What, what, why, why, what's your motivation? Now, yesterday morning's talk, the very first talk, was about that. Well, I, try, I tried to show you the motivation from my own personal life in the first century and ask you why your motivations aren't similar. Right. And then we looked at the issues of being uh, being unloving, didn't we? Like, what 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 do we really feel about love? Well, that that requires investigation. What do you really feel about change? That requires investigation. What do you really feel about the reasons why you personally remain unloving? That requires investigation. Why do you believe things are loving when God knows they're unloving? Well, that requires investigation. Right doesn't it really if we're sincere it requires investigation if you I, I'm saying to you if you investigate these things thoroughly and you work your way through them you're going to be immensely happier than you currently are your body is going to feel better than it currently does and not only that you will influence the lives of other people in positive ways rather than negative ways and eventually if enough of us do it the whole world might change right but it's not going to change while a group of you that already heard of going, oh, it's all too hard. I'm just going to keep making the same choices that I've always made because that's more convenient. You see? How I feel you each have the capacity to do different. But I also honour and respect the fact that each of you have a will and you're allowed to use it however you wish but stop blaming other people for how you use your will right take responsibility for how you use your will if you want to if you want to be unloving be unloving that's your choice i don't recommend it but it's your choice you're allowed to do it right but take responsibility for the fact that you're actually doing it. That you actually made a choice and you've decided to do it that way. So that, that's uh, what I wanted to say to you really in this particular part. We're going to have a Q&A in a few minutes about this particular aspect. And there's a lot more that could be said in this particular discussion. Like this particular discussion, I could carry on with you for a few days and still not cover everything that uh, I would like to cover with you. But, but what I'm trying to get to you, to you to do is this. I want to present a short piece of information to you. And then I would like to see some people who take self-responsibility deciding what they're going to do with that information rather than a group of people being spoon-fed like a baby right and then walking away and not doing anything about it in their lives the apostle paul said to a, co a congregation back in the first century after my death he wrote to them and he said you're all still like babies feeding on milk right because you don't want the real food and this is a primary problem with this particular issue that we're raising today. We, we, we want to be like babies who don't have to take responsibility. 
We want to be like that because it means somebody else does it for us. And doesn't it feel wonderful when other people do these things for us and give us these things and do these things without expecting anything in return? It just feels wonderful, doesn't it? Right, but actually a person who takes responsibility does not think that's wonderful. Right. So I'd like to encourage you to go back over the material when it comes out and actually set some goals in your life to be far more dedicated to resolving these particular questions that we're asking you. Now, what we're hoping to do is give you a start in that by encouraging you to do it and showing you what kind of feelings that might be present within yourself. But at the end of the day, you're responsible for that. And remember, God's already doing everything God can do for you to have a relationship with God. God's already doing everything God needs to do for that relationship to occur. God's already attempting to pour his love all over you. God's already attempting to do that with you right now. The fact that it isn't being felt by you is due to choices and decisions. It's due to how you're using your will. And I think that, to me, that's, that's a really reassuring thing. Because it means if something's not happening, I know where the problem is. <laughs> If, I, if between myself and God something's not happening, I know where the problem is. The problem's not with God. I also know that I can't judge the fact that it's with myself because that's unloving to do that all the time. All I need to do is be like a scientist trying to investigate the reason why it's happening. And if I'm really dedicated, I'll do that. I'll find the reason eventually. And if I'm really dedicated... Like, and I really have a heartfelt desire to find out, it won't be eventually, it will be pretty close to immediately that I find out. And the only reason why it's not immediate is because I'm not yet fully sincere or not yet fully d dealing with something. And I don't blame God for that or you for that. That's my problem. Just as it's yours for your life, so it is too for mine. And it doesn't matter how many problems we've each got. Some of you have had more difficult lives than others. Right? Some of you have had what, I, what I'd call spoon, you know, spoon in the, what is it called? A spoon in the, <laughs> silver spoon lives, yes. And, uh, and, you know, that's a terrible problem. Because you, stay, you, you then get to expect a whole heap of things that are not loving. You have a whole heap of demands that the average person doesn't have that you're going to have to give up. So, so my suggestion is let yourself work through these things sincerely and stop, stop taking unloving actions and instead find out how and why you're still being unloving. Find out. Do as much as you can to find it out for yourself personally, without needing anybody else to tell you, without needing anybody else to reassure you, without needing anybody else to feed you, without needing anybody else to direct you or guide you, because you've already got all the guides direct, uh, direction you already need. It's all there. God's already wanting to give it to you. It's just that he can't because you're stopping him. You're stopping him from doing it. Okay, so if we can have a break uh, for, yeah, maybe if we make it 10 minutes and there'll be a bit of a shortened Q&A about that subject. Thank you. <laughs>